Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, we are excited. We're excited to, uh, to be here as a part of Cornerstone. Cornerstone has always been our heart and our family. And uh, we're excited to be taking this, this next step in, in walking forward with the life of the church. Um, I don't know about you, but for, for my life, I've gone through those things, kind of what Celeste shared a few weeks ago, which those seasons of life and seasons of your walk with God, where you're trusting him for new levels of things. And as we, as we walked out into missions, we took that same step of faith to say yes to God and hold on to him to what that's going to look like for the future. And God did amazing things. As we continued to walk with him every day, he did amazing things. And as we were headed home, and as we said yes to come on staff here, and walked away from missions in a more permanent role, we were saying yes to God. And we're thankful for this next thing that God is going to do and continue to do it with us and through us collectively as a, as a church. Would you say amen to that? Yes. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone, we're going to be working together on some things today. Um, you know, te today is Team Sunday, and so you can connect with us uh, online on, on all of our stuff at cornerstoneaz.org. Um, we've been talking about fasting and prayer, and we just finished our fasting and prayer yesterday. Um, we came to a culmination of that of 21 days of fasting in prayer. How many people was powerful for you, the fasting and prayer that we did? It was for me as well. Praise God. There's something that's really great about that, that idea of fasting and prayer is that you're focusing on what the Lord is saying. We ask that question, where is Jesus leading you? And that's the very thing we've been fasting and praying about. As we went without meals or went without media or we, we did a specific things that we were fasting from, we were focusing and feasting on the word of God. That's what we were doing. And so I'm going to encourage you that even during this time when we finish the more traditional fast, that you continue in your practice of spending lots of time with Jesus Christ, that you would abide with Christ. Um, one, of, one of our friends, Dick Brogdon, he speaks about these, these key leaders that you would read about in early church life, in people that went to the far places in the world and, and really did some amazing things. God really worked through them. Those people would sit and they would just soak in the presence of God. They would spend copious amounts of time in God's presence every day. And because they were synced to his heart, he did amazing things through their life. And they were willing to walk without fear into very dangerous and scary places. And he was, they were able, God was able to do amazing things because they were open to him. Let me encourage you that you would do the same during this year, that you wouldn't stop in your practice of spending time, but that you would make that room and carve away those other things that would take precedent over your time with God, that you would seek him first. Amen? I've been using this image of what it means to be a, G a follower of Jesus uh, as we walk with him. None of us have arrived. All of us are in process, right? It's much like many of our football teams today. We're always in process. It's that whole thing where it's like, we're almost great. Nope. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we definitely need some help. We need some help. And even when you think you're great, then your great players become old and you need to be good again, right? And so you're always in process. As we're thinking about team, uh, talking about team Sunday, uh, you know, obviously we all, we, we all are wearing our sports apparel, different people. We're wearing football or basketball or hockey or, or whatever's, whatever your thing is, world football. And, and I love those different things. One of the interesting things for me is the heritage of people where they cheer for, uh, for American football, for NFL teams within the states, the continental states. Check this out. There's a cool map of it all of all the different places that people kind of support. And you can kind of see where your team, kind of who they're represented by or not. Um, you know, there's, man, there's like the Jaguars don't have much of a, uh, you know, much of a chance down there in the corner. And, and so it's one of these things where you kind of see the heritage that's there. I know for many people, the reason that they cheer for a team is because their parents cheered for that team or their grandparents cheered for that team. It's like a family heritage. How many people would say that's, that's kind of how you got drawn into it? Some people, it's where you, were, you grew up or where you were born. How many people, it's because you're where you are born, where you grew up. And some, some people, it's because you were a bandwagon fan and you just fell in love with the team because they were good at that time. Anybody? <laughs> That's very honest. I like that. People are like, oh, man, I'm such a Steelers fan. I'm like, you ever been to Pittsburgh? They're like, no. I'm like, I know for my, for my, my dad's mom, Millie, they were Cowboys fans. And they were Cowboys fans because... Well, you'll need to repent later. No, the, <laughs> joking, joking, 
The Lord be with you. I had, I had a friend of mine who was, who was complaining, because two of our ladies up here who are doing a great job in leading worship were wearing cowboys apparel. But that was his wife was one of them, man. And I'm like, Tim, you can't, you can't say that about your wife, man. No, I love that. But she, she did it because it was the only thing they could see on TV. The only team they could see on TV was the Cowboys, so that's why they supported them. So it's this thing how we, we attach ourselves to this idea and we start to put emotion into it. And really, even the players aren't loyal to it, right? It's only about a paycheck many times or the coaches, they, they coach three, four, five teams during different places. And, and so we are the ones who invest all that time and energy. And much like Colin alluded to today or Angus alluded to today, you know, the real team that we are on is on God's team. We're on the team of Christ, and we are him first above all other things. And so I hope that's your heart as well. We're Jesus first, then country, then this, then that. That's how it goes. You're on the team of Christ first. And whenever you become Jersey first or this or that first above Christ, then you have things out of whack. And we don't want to be those kind of people. Now, I love American football. Even as I lived abroad, I would play American football, even on... We'd play it on Xbox. We'd play like uh, in Madden. This is the new one coming out with <laughs> Uncle Rico. I think he's on the cover this next year. I'm not sure. But the, the game today is a big battle between two, two mega important pe- things that are colliding. It's going to be Shakira and J-Lo. They're the big things that are colliding this today. <laughs> so they're going to be happening. Um, I like this. This is a nice diagram. It's people that are cheering for in the Super Bowl It's the Chiefs, the Niners, and people just happy the Patriots aren't in it. And if you're a Patriots fan, I'm sorry. uh, Love to you. Love to you. Peace be upon you. Go with you. Um, You know, it's also interesting as we talk about this stuff, just be very careful in your Super Bowl party. We're not having service tonight. I want you to enjoy it with your family, your friends, your community. Go and be a light where you are in 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 your community there. Uh, so we won't have services tonight. But as you do, as you prepare to have the Super Bowl parties or go to them, make sure you spell it correctly on the cake you bring. <laughs> Be very careful with your spelling and grammar. All right, so we're going to ask this question. What does it mean to be on a team? What does it mean to be on a team? For me, uh, some years ago, Celeste and I, when we were first fundraising to go out to, to go to Paris, we were trying to book up any services we can. And man, we were excited. And, and I was booking things into the next year. And as I did, I would take any opportunity. And we'd find people that have these services at night. And I was like, oh, I could be here in the morning. And then we'd go to this other church at night. And, and so I scheduled this church. We were in Mesa in the morning. And then we were way on the east side of the state, like barely inside the state of Arizona at nighttime at a church there. And I was excited about it. I was like, hey, we booked a, another Sunday night. It's going to be great. And, you know, two for one kind of a thing. And then I realized that that year the, the Cardinals actually were good at football. And we got better and better. And we kept moving up, moving up, moving up. And then we made the big game. We made the Super Bowl. And that was the same night that I was speaking at this place. And so I was like, Pastor, hey, um, so, I, you know, I'm sure that you guys are doing something with, your, you know, your congregation and engaging with people. He's like, no, 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 come on, come on down. I was like, great, 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 wonderful. We'll be there. So we were there, man. It was a good service. There's, you know, a couple people in the front, and it was a good, it was a good service. But praise, praise God, we, we get out of there, and we got, you know, we pray for some folks. And for the people that were there, it was actually very good. But we, we got out of there and caught the very last quarter of the game. We, we, Celeste was like doing ninja moves on the, you know, on the radio trying to find the thing. And we find them as they're, as they're, they're calling the game on, on, on the radio. And we're driving back to, to, to the valley from the far, far side of the state. And we're, we're listening, we're listening, we're listening. And we hear that, that the Cardinals get ahead. It's in the fourth quarter. We get ahead. And we are excited in the car. We're like, yes, yes, this is so great. And then we hear the stammer in the voice of the person a few minutes later whenever this thing happens. You see this picture. Whenever the catch in the corner and they, in the, the beautiful, I'll say this, as outside just a catch, beautiful catch, drags the toes, catches the thing in the corner of the end zone, and the Cardinals lose in like the last moments of the game. And so we drove for four hours home to the other side of the valley with the feeling of being a loser and not even getting to see it. 
But it's because we invest, we invest ourselves in it, right? We, we have our, it's some investment and then it's our team, we want to root for it. And so it's an interesting thing because I'm all for that. I, obviously, I feel that way. I feel that way about, uh, about soccer. I feel that way about other things. We cheer for it. But we have to have our priorities correct. Here's a video for us. We'll continue today. Don't you just love football? All over the world, people love football. Sure, they may play it a bit different. Shoot, some people even call this football. But no matter how it's played, people love it. Okay, if you're a female or like classical music, I might let you off the hook. But boom, what's not to love about that? We love it, love it, love it. But have you ever thought why? See, I got myself a few theories. I think we love football for the good times, the moments, the excitement, the anticipation. I think we love it for the memories. Football takes us home, back to our roots, back to our families, back to earlier, simpler times. And I think we love it because it makes us feel like we're part of something bigger. See, we get a team to which we belong. We got something bigger to aspire to. There's victory and glory for the taking. We are represented. We may not be able to take the field, but we are part of it. Whatever it is, we love it. And so, we watch, we play, we celebrate the wins, we mourn the losses, we dare to dream, we imitate, we reminisce, we think about what might have been, and we pass it on to the next generation. Football shows us that life is more than ordinary. It points to something more. Because the sad thing about football is that it comes to an end. Before you know it, the season is over, the cheers go silent, and the glory fades away. Even superstar careers come to an end. And that gets me thinking, there is something more. There is something bigger and better. We can be part of a team that is measured not in its thousands, but in its billions. We have a chance to do something that counts on a field much bigger than a football field. We have a chance to follow and imitate a captain that came not to be served, but to lay down his life as a ransom for many. A captain who won the victory for us. And what we do for him goes on beyond record books and memories and on into eternity. The things we do in his name may never be applauded by the masses. We may never achieve the fame of our sporting heroes, but in the end, it isn't about our fame, but his. But what he gives us is a gift so huge that, well, shoot, it blows my mind. So many times you can have really great, amazing players, and then you can have the weakest links on the team. And many people will say that your team is only as good as its weakest player. And so it's an interesting thing for us because that's not how God treats us. Because on, on the team of, of his team, all of us are in process of being better. So we, we, we're all different than that, that idea. Um, the thing is he values you, and he values you even before you're on team with him. In fact, the reason he came is so you could be on team with him. And I love that. It's interesting, the intentionality that's put into sports. Uh, for the real sports nuts, they, they know all of this. They know the coaching and the types of coaches they have. They know what college they were at, what high school they were at, how they were coached, what kind of game they run or they play, what kind of, uh, what kind of strategies they use. And th there's a lot of levels of this stuff that's in, in, intended. I was listening to a podcast. It's uh, the Freakonomics Radio podcast. They were talking about... One of the teams that's in the Super Bowl this year, the San Francisco 49ers, and how a few years ago they were at, they were like not even close to what they wanted from their team. And using them as an example, they started talking about how they restarted everything. They restarted their, their GM, their coach, their coaching staff. They, start, they pretty much flipped all of their players to get a different approach to the game so they could go and do what they really wanted to do. 
And I thought, wow, that's really crazy. I'm so thankful that God doesn't do that with us. He's like, well, you're out, and we'll replace you. You know, it's not like that. But these guys, after working a process, it didn't come overnight. I did take the takeaway from them is the process of intentionality and getting up and keep on going. Because what they learned from that is that they're going to pursue this thing even when they make mistakes, and eventually they're going to get where they want to be. So interesting that this year proves that out. And this is just a few years after they had made those changes. And it's one of those things that can kind of be a proof to us that if we're, if we're focused and if we work together as the body of Christ, then we could see amazing things happen as we are the vessel that he uses. Would you say amen to that? Now, when we think about team, especially uh, from a business perspective, you always have images like this. You have pictures, you know, of people in synergy. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about? All my business people that give talks on PowerPoint, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, we need synergy. We need something like this. We need high fives in the business room, right? We need people that are, you know, culturally ambiguous, that look hip and cool, wearing beanies at the office. We need them to work together for us. And that's the first point that we're going to do of three points today, is that a team works together. We'll look about this on something called being equally yoked. If you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone, you can move to 2 Corinthians 6 today. You know, equally yoked is an interesting term because for us, especially city people, especially in nowadays, most of us have no kind of connection to farm work or even if we did have farm work, we wouldn't really have the connection to what they're talking about back in this day in scripture. It's actually the idea of, of animals being tied together so that they can work harder than one individual animal. And they do so because they have way more force combined than they would by themselves. And so in this case, they would yoke together or tie together oxen, and then they would move together in order to plow. And we would see this throughout scripture. This is even used today in parts of the world where they don't have machinery. They don't have all those things. You know, they, they live on multiple tiers where you can't run a tractor. And so they use oxen. They're still using those traditional methods even now. And so as we look at the scripture, it starts to say some things to us about how we're to live our lives, how we're to be on team. It says this, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. It doesn't mean here in scripture, as we look at this, it doesn't mean that you can be friends with someone. The idea is that you don't partner together your life and your direction with them. Does that make sense? I don't know if you've ever had a friend, but as that, that would be a bad influence on you. But as you're a Christ follower, you'll have a friend that's like trying to pull you away from what you know God has spoken to you. You ever had that person? You ever been that person? Maybe your friend invited you to church today. <laughs> the idea is this, that, that that's the thing that it's the scripture is warning us against is that we don't align our lives we don't tie ourselves to someone and the direction they're going. They're going to pull us astray. We have to work together to, and go in the same direction towards where we want to attain. Do you, do you understand that? If you've ever been in a big crowded city, like Celeste and I, in, you know, living in, in Alexandria, living in Cairo and Paris, other places. If you ever walk down a really busy street and you're trying to go the opposite direction of the flow of people, it's nearly impossible. How many people know what I'm saying? And so culturally, that's who we're called to be, is those people going against many times what culture is trying to do. We're, we're trying to keep ourselves on the straight path that, that Christ has laid out in front of us. And so to do that by ourselves is very difficult. But when you do it with others, then you find it easier to do. Because you're, working, you're walking together and you see that the path in front of you begins to open up. Uh, I know for us, especially having kids and traveling the world with little kids, one of the best things that we ever had was a stroller. Because a stroller is like a tank when it comes to crowds of people. Because you just push the stroller and people move out of your way. And if you don't believe me, get a stroller, put a baby doll in the stroller and push it through crowds of people, they will move out of your way. Unless, of course, they can see the baby doll, then they'll just think you're a crazy person and probably move for that reason. But you guys get the idea. The idea is that it's this, I th this thing when we work together, we can see greater things happen than if we're by ourselves. 
The same is true whenever you're trying to work straight lines as far as in this work of being yoked together. You think about these fields, and of course we have amazing machinery nowadays that it's all computer elevated and all these other things, and you lower it and it's perfect, and all of them look symmetrical. But they don't have this. They pull two at a time, maybe one at a time. And they're, they're going back over trying to make it as straight as possible in the original traditional way. So if you have someone fighting against you, this becomes problematic. It, it actually says about it in Scripture, it talks about an ox and a donkey being tied together. Now you could imagine, just in the concept of this, the ox is much stronger, the ox is a hard worker, the ox typically is one that gets trained and really goes and does what the person driving it does. Whereas the donkey is not known for that. The donkey is known for a completely different thing. In fact, it says that in scripture, it says this, you shall not, not plow with an ox and a donkey together. It says it in Deuteronomy. And the reason is this, because the donkey wants to do what the donkey wants to do. You might have a different word than donkey in your translation. <laughs> We're going to go with donkey today. But, you know, there's the thing is the donkey, you can train a donkey to do something, but it's after a lot of effort and pro kind of abusing the donkey to get it to do something. But that's the only way, and usually only by itself. In Egypt, we saw donkeys every single day. They pulled carts like this of fruit and vegetables. They picked up trash. They did all sorts of things, but it was always one donkey. It was never a pair of donkeys tied together. It definitely wasn't a donkey and something else tied together. Because even if you have a powerful ox and you have a donkey beside it tied to it, the donkeys pulling back on that ox will keep the ox from doing what it's supposed to do correctly. Even if you're strong in your faith and you're dedicated to this thing and you're taught up in the way that you're supposed to go straight, if you're tied to a donkey, the donkey's going to want to pull back and not want to go and it's going to make the lines of your life a mess. So watch who you're tied to. I'll say this. Donkeys working hard, man. In, in, in Egypt, they work really hard. They do this kind of work. They even work as the, at the zoo as zebras. <laughs> where people have literally spray painted them at the zoo. <laughs> Come on, zoo. But if you've ever been around a donkey, I know people that have been around donkeys or had donkeys where a donkey will reach up and get, get its teeth out there and get a nip at you. Like, they, they don't want to go where you want it to go. They'll, you can pull against it. How many people know what I'm talking about? And they're to get out there and get you. And, and here's the thing. We all know, we all know people that have a personality of a donkey. <laughs> Maybe it's you. Here's the thing. Don't be a donkey. Can we agree? Don't be a donkey today. Or use your other translation word in the scripture. The second thing, that, so that's the first thing, is that a team works together. So when we're talking about Team Sunday, a team works together. The second thing is this, a team helps each other. A team helps each other. There's this piece of scripture in Ecclesiastes that talks about a cord of three strands. You might have heard of this before. So it says this, and you've seen it many places. It says, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And the concept is that because of its strength, it actually magnifies the strength of it just by being connected together. And it's often used in places like in marriage or other things where it's talking about two people connected with God and those three things being woven together in the strength that's there. Now, I was working uh, at, at a, in the middle of university uh, up in La Cañada, uh, which is actually in the Angeles Crest Mountains above Los Angeles. It's absolutely beautiful. Because you get up above the smog and get out of the rat race, and man, it's just gorgeous. In fact, many of the movies you see are actually where they're driving through Europe in cars are usually actually up there in the mountain just above Los Angeles. But that's where it is, and it was absolutely beautiful. And we worked at this camp. Uh, it was called Angeles Crest Christian Camp. And I, I actually did rigging, so we, we, did, we, we helped people get into climbing apparatus so they could do zip lines, they could do climbing walls, they could do a tantor pole, they could do climb, all sorts of different things. We were called the adventure team, so we helped them do all these great sports, and we were on a, a megaphone half the time, kind of like what Pastor Angus did today, doing, you know, really fun things. And that was what my job was for a summer, working up with those guys. But here's the thing, as fun as it was and as crazy as it was, you can't have the fun and be crazy if it's not safe first. And so you had to be able to trust your partners you're working with 
that you were working on the same set of values. And so the first thing that my boss did, which is a really interesting thing, my boss, his name was Josh Nepper. Josh was actually a professional snowboarder who was sponsored by Quicksilver and a bunch of other things. Then he became a professional mountain boarder, which you guys probably don't know. It's where you take a snowboard and put big wheels on it and run down the mountain in the summertime. So think about how snow protects you from rocks and then just take all of that away and then go really fast on, a, on like a board with wheels. So he was super crazy, like had no care about his own personal well-being at all because he like, he's an extreme sports athlete. But the thing he understood was safety. And the thing he understood was being communicating together. So when we sat down as, together as a team, he, he talked about this very thing. He said, listen, we have to be together. We have to be united. We can't let things get in between us. We have to work this way because in order for everyone to have fun, they have to be safe. And for us to do that, we have to communicate effectively. And so he had this very thing, and he, he created what I have never heard or seen since. He created an idea of a kneelet, which was a, a, a cord, a three-strand cord braided together. <clears throat> And he actually, he made it and put it above, right below our knee, above your calf, and he actually seared it together, and it was actually there like a bracelet, but on your leg, and all of us had it, because we ran shorts every day, so all of us had it on our leg. He's like, listen, every time you see it, think about how you are an example to other people. And I was just amazed, thank you. I was just amazed at that very thing, thinking about how we are to be that example. And even coming from someone crazy like Josh, that we could be those people who think about being an example and tying together and working with a team. Would you say amen to that? We see it in scripture as it talks about it here. It says in verse seven of Ecclesiastes four, again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to his toil. His eyes are neither satisfied with riches and so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity in an unhappy business. So we have Solomon writing about this person who's out there trying to grind and get all these things, but he's not with anyone. He's by himself, and he sees this as vanity. He sees this as pointless. And so his counter to that is here in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no other to lift him up. Wow. It says this, and later on in the scripture, it says, And though a, might, a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken See, if we stand together, if we help each other, if we stand and we are united, then we are not alone. We're working together. You're on team with Jesus. That's who he called us to be, that we would be his family, that we would follow after him. That's what he talked about. And so that we would be those same people, that we would not see the vanity of chasing things by ourselves, but that we would collectively would work together. Because when obstacles come, even when adversi adversities come, and another person attacks you, you stand together and you can see you overcome. See, you're standing with Jesus. You're also standing with other Christians in, in a community of faith. And as you stand there, you see the overcoming that's available for you. If you're by yourself, you're by yourself. It's like that old thing you saw in your grandmother's bathroom of footprints in the sand where Jesus is with you and carries you through the most difficult spots because you're with him, not the other way around. A team helps each other. A team helps each other. The third is this, a team values each part. I'm gonna talk about the body of Christ, the body of of Christ. You know, there's a lot of things that talk about the body of Christ in Scripture. There's several different Scriptures that are available there. Uh, it says this in Ephesians. It says, He gave the apostles and prophets, evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We say amen to that. Again, we see it in Colossians in a different way. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So it was talking about those things. 
We see it here in 1 Corinthians 12, where it starts to really break this down for us. And it says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. It continues in verse 12. It says, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Would you say thanks be to God for that? We see that because for us, especially those of us who are not of Jewish heritage, we were actually grafted into the body of Christ. We see it in the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit pours out on the early church in Acts 2 and then to the Gentiles in Acts 10. It's an extension and we are brought into the family of God. So as they're writing here and Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, he's writing about those very things that we are together as the body of Christ. We are belonging to his team. And you know, for all of us now, especially in this modern day, we understand how the body works much at a much deeper level than they did in their day. But even here, they talk about how we're all part of one body. You know, these different layers of what it looks like for our body, our different systems that are there. Um, uh, the other night, I got a chance, Celeste and I, we went to our girls' school, and each one of them and some of the other kids in the church that they go there were explaining to us parts of the body and the systems and how they work. And so Amelia was talking to us about muscles and tendons, and we had some great stuff that was going on about, about um, how, you, how you digest, and they showed us the marble and put it all the way down. We had, we had the, the lower intestine and the, the large intestine and, and the excrement that came out of that. That was explained to us. We also had the heart and all its chambers and what that looked like, and and we also had blood in the platelets and all the different parts of the blood. And you even got to put your hand in there and kind of feel, you know, the gooiness of it. And the question I asked to all of those kids is, how important is this thing that you, that you worked on? Oh, it's very important. Because without this, you'll die. And you know what? They were all correct. They were all correct. And even though they were all different things, it was all different parts of the digestive, it was all different parts of the circulatory system, muscles, whatever it is, it, it, they were all correct. All those parts were important, every single one. Verse 21 says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. In verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We know this. We know this in how it works in our own physical body that you can be feeling great except have one thing hurt and all you can think about is how that one thing hurts. So everything hurts. Am I right? You know, you have the opposite version of that where it's like, you know, if something hurts and then you like slam your thumb, then it's like, my thumb hurts, but also the other thing, right? So it's like one does not take away from the other. It just, you just hurt more. So this is the point is that we are one body, we're called to be together, we're told, called to be working together. And if one is in pain, that we would support them, that we would go to them and help them, because when they suffer, we suffer. But whenever one has a victory, we cheer with them because whenever they're victorious, we're victorious. And so we stand together in that way. It, it, it's one of those things that doesn't make sense all the time in our mind, but definitely makes sense in the natural, and even more sense in the supernatural. Because it's one of those things, whenever we are collective and we are together, the body works properly. And we've all known, whenever our body doesn't work correctly, how it affects us. So let us be the part of the body that works correctly. And that the others around us, we encourage them that they would work correctly. That all of us would work and pull together so that we would have that same attitude as part of God's team. Would you say amen? So these are the three things that we talked about today. A team works together. A team helps each other. And a team values each part. As we are those people who are working on team, we want to be those things. We want to be part of God's team. We don't want to pull back. We want to be going where he's going. We want to pursue after what he is doing. We want to be on journey with Christ. And if you're not today, if you're holding back don't be a donkey. 
be a team member. Work together with the team. Don't have that attitude that draws you down. Be one of those people that God can rely on to see the work happen through them. I'm asked Colin to come. We, we have this question, are you a part of God's team? Are you a part of God's team? You know, whenever we talk about Team Sunday and we have all these different questions, the question we're really asking you is, have you embraced Jesus? Have you embraced Jesus? We talked a lot about a lot, a lot of things today on how we are as Christ followers, but the real thing comes to this. It comes that we are Christ followers because of what he's done on our behalf and because we've embraced that sacrifice for us. So when we see the image of the cross, the cross becomes the sacrificial point so that we can be brought back into communion, into, into relationship with Jesus and connected back to the Father. And it's this thing that he did on our behalf. We couldn't do it. We can't earn it. We can't work hard enough to get there. He did it for us. And so we receive it in grace. We receive it coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I invite you into my life. I believe you are who you say you are. I want to start a new life with you. Paul writes to the church and he says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says, for with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Today you might be here and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to respond to him in that way. Or maybe you have in the past responded to Jesus, but you haven't lived for him and you've walked away from him. And today you wanna recommit yourself to that. I'm gonna give you that opportunity today. I'm asking if everyone would bow their head. If that's you today, people aren't looking at you, but I wanna see if you would let me know by raising your hand that today is a day where you wanna say, yes, Jesus, I wanna invite you into my heart. I wanna, or I want to recommit my life to you. If that's you today, would you raise your hand? I see those hands there. Thank you, Lord. I see the hand there. If that's you and you raise your hand, I see that. You want to pray a prayer just like that? It says, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I invite you into my life. I believe that you are the, the one who saves us, that you are the one who forgives us. So forgive me of my sin, that I would walk according to your ways, that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. And if you pray a prayer like that today, then today is that day for you of salvation. And we, we rejoice with you because you're part of the body of Christ. You're part of God's team today. And so we celebrate with you because you've experienced the forgiveness, the peace that you've been looking for. So praise God, we stand with you in that decision today.